What's up, guys? It's James from This Week in Airsoft, back again with another interview. You know how we do it This Week in Airsoft? We don't stop. We're bringing you all the, all the hot people in Airsoft who are doing big things. Today, I've got for you Thomas O'Rourke. He is the... Uh, you're the, the the main guy, the 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 big cheese over at yeah, Msato. That's that's me. I'm pretty much uh, I, I bring in people, but for the most part, I'm running it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Cool. 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 Um, yeah. Guys may not may or may not have heard of Msato. Msato is uh, I'm gonna say that for me, some of the a lot of the videos that was that were featured that featured their events are some of the videos that most every guy has ever seen. You know, whether it was Green Mountain Rangers or stuff by Dan DeMann, the guys from uh, up up northeast, uh, they have a training video that you was at one of your events. Um, just these are like some of the old super high number airsoft videos that everyone's seen. Um, you guys have been hosting big events for a long time, just as long as John Liu, um, and some some of the really long 24 hour ops, correct? Yeah. 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 So that was uh, that was something we had started. Um, you know, it's actually, it's actually, uh, when we decided to do, uh, Pine Plains, a lot of people have heard of Pine Plains, sure, yeah. um, up at Fort Drum. And although it's associated, you know, now a lot of people think of it as, as a black sheep, um, Operation Pine Plains, which was Operation Pine Plains one through four, those were actually MSATO events. Um, and then what we did is when black sheep and I broke off, and I'll just tell, you know, some of the viewers may not know it, but Black Sheep and I are cousins, uh, first cousins. Our mothers are uh, our sisters, and he's known me all of my life. Uh, he's <laughs> older than I am, so uh, we, we grew up together. And I got involved in Airsoft, uh, oh, I guess it's been over, over 10 years. Um, and then I brought him in. Uh, when he came back and it took me actually about two years of talking to him to try getting him to come out and, uh, actually see it because he was in the military. He's like, ah, oh, this, you know, this is, you know, this is a bunch of jokers and everything else like that. And <laughs> I said, yeah, that's true. We are. Um, <laughs> but how about coming out and playing anyway? And so I had him come up to a, a game and we ran these games up in, uh, up in Tallinn, Massachusetts. And it was actually one of the original places where airsoft started uh, I think it was probably close to 20 years ago. And I mean, they were doing, when they first started doing games there, they were doing like, they're like, they were lucky. They had like 10, 20 guys show up. And, and I remember I ran, I did an event up there and it was a, uh, I started in January and they, I ended up running the, doing the first battle for Tallinn as a participant. And I was like, man, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I got involved. It's, this is real Milsim. And it was, that's what it was really about, you know, back then. And um, the guys who were involved in it, and there were, there were probably like 50 guys who showed up for that event. And that, that would seem like it was huge. I was like, this is awesome. And so I ended up getting involved and started running scenarios after that. And after that, I ended up running Battle for Talon too. And up in the Northeast, we had this uh, website. It's called uh, NEASG, which is Northeast Airsoft Group. Right, right. And at the time, it was, you know, it, was, it, it probably is still one of the largest, even though it's a forum based, it was one of the largest forum based. And we had at the time, there were over 3,000 people who were on it. And my whole thing was we were going into the winter, so we were going into the slowdown period. That's how it used to be, you know, 12 years ago. You know, going to winter and everyone went to hibernation. You had a couple of people would come out and play. And so I remember saying to put it up on the on the NESG and I said, look it, if we can just get ten percent of you guys to actually come out and play at one event, I said we'd have a great game. And we ended up getting three hundred players came out that May. Wow. Uh, and that was the biggest event in the Northeast at the time. This was twelve years ago. That was probably the biggest event in the U.S. at that time. <laughs> Back then, yeah, it yeah. actually was. It was like you know, and we just we just blew it out, and and we had um, uh, we had just you know a great great response uh, from that, and then uh, the following year, right after that, that's when uh, so now we we started forming. A lot of people started to come out, and everyone kind of realized, you know, these big games are possible. 
if people show up and we, and, you know, we, and we can organize them. And actually, that was one of the key elements was actually having an organized event. And uh, we did some really cool stuff uh, up at that one. And I had, um, uh, I had done some stuff. We ended up, uh, that was one of the first night games that was run. And we ran Jeez. the game uh, Friday night. And I had gone to, uh, I had contacted a local uh, airport. And I said, what do you guys, where do you, you know, like when a plane crashes, where, where's it go? <laughs> and so they put me in contact with the, the scrapyard that does, you know, airplanes. And I had bought a deuce and a half back then, contacted the, uh, contacted the scrapyard for the airplanes and actually drove there with my deuce and a half. And I got to, on two different days. I, one day I went and I had them load a plane in the back of my deuce and a half. And I drove it up to Thailand and talk about looks and, you know, driving a deuce and a half with a wrecked plane in the back of it <laughs> through these towns. I bet. It, it was crazy. And I, I actually brought it and I brought, drove it into the woods up there. Went back a couple days later, got another plane, threw it in the back of the deuce and a half and drove it up. And what we did is um, it was the first time we started using real props because um, I, I remember and I'm kind of. I'm probably boring people at this point, but one of the things I hated, one of the first games I went to was they had a down pilot scenario. And I, I remember going in and we, we rushed in, we got into the, into the, it was a paintball field and we got in there and I remember they had a stick figure and the pilot was actually made out of, it, it was a stick figure made out of uh, plumbing copper, but it, it was about five feet tall. And for them, that was a cool prop that they actually had something that looked like a person right. you know, <laughs> as opposed to capture the flag. And I remember the guy ended up going in and grabbing it with one hand and running away with it. And I was like, you know, the concept is cool, but you got to have real props. Yeah. And so that's where I kind of, kind of got involved with the whole, you know, if we're going to use a prop, it's got to be, let's get it something that that's true in nature. And weight is a big factor for me. And people who come to my events, they know that that my props are realistic looking. And one thing that they'll always say is they're heavy as hell. And if I tell you to go get a laptop, you better find the right one because there could be multiple ones in there. <laughs> uh, so going back to the Battle for Tallinn, uh, we ended up having a night game. And we started it Friday night for anyone who wanted to play. And we did it in this orchard and we ended up having the players go out there and uh, we ended up using, uh, ended up using fireworks as well. So, ha and I had an opt for, for that as well uh, because I needed a, a control force uh, for, for being able to run the event. So as the two teams are going across this 90 acre orchard, it's an overgrown orchard. All of a sudden I have my opt for, you know, start shooting off the fireworks. So we start having these fireworks go up. And uh, they're going up in the sky, and everyone's like, holy shit, what the hell's going on? And then I saw we had the smoke going off. And so I radioed both teams. I said, you know, we got a down pilot situation. <laughs> and uh, they said, we got a down, you know, down pilot. I said, you know, you guys got to find the stuff at the plane. And people are, like, figuring out it's just a the smoke. They actually went out there like, holy shit, there's a fucking plane out in the orchard. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so you guys, had a, did you, guys, you guys had a dedicated Op 4 back then. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, actually I was, uh, that, that kind of gets it when, when, when I was running it with, uh, when we got into Pine Plains, um, Black Sheep, uh, first Pine Plains, he, he was against an op four. And I'm just telling the story just cause it's, it's funny because, um, he, when he, when I was running for battle for Talon, I had him leading one side and I was the event organizer. So he was a CO. And so he was going against um, my other buddy, Casca, as the other CO, and we had an op four in there. And we were using, not only did we use them as an op four, but we used them as role players as well. And so we were, you know, we were doing this stuff, you know, early on, you had taught 12 years ago, you know, we were doing, doing this type of stuff. And uh, uh, Black Sheep ended up going up against some of these op four role players and he hated it. Because <laughs> they were just, he just, uh, 
we were we were really screwing with them on uh, on some of this stuff. And and again, it was like, okay, go get a computer, and uh, they go in and they just grab the first one that they saw. They overran a base, and I ended up having three computers in that base. And all they did is they were thinking old school, go in, capture the flag, and you know you know look for something and run in, grab it, and and take off. Right. And what we were doing is trying to teach them. If you're going to do military simulation and you're a special forces group, which everyone wants to pretend they are, when they go in, you don't just grab the first computer. You actually have to do a, an actual search. Right. And so that, that's some of the stuff that we actually started to implement is you actually have to think outside the box and not just do old school capture the flag. And although we're using a computer for the flag, we ended up bringing more into it than that. And we ended up, um, uh, old, <laughs> another old story. I'm kind of going back on some of these, but it was, it was one that, um, <clears throat> when I had GMR and I've known those guys forever and they used to come up to Tallinn, that's where they played. And one of the first times that they, they came and came to one of my events, they ended up coming in and they did that exact same thing. And we had three computers in the base. And they were overrunning the bases because I had the other team was spread out over three bases and they were working the other team and they were condensed. So they were able to overrun the first base, overrun the second base, overrun the third base. And they grabbed the first computer and then took off. So what ended up happening is we ended up consolidating. The other team was able to consolidate around the main base and so they ended up radio and they wanted their extraction. And so what they had to do is they had to radio and get their extraction point, And then they had to hold the extraction point for a certain amount of time. And I said, you guys didn't get the computer as the event organizer, they call and go, okay, we're ready. We got the computer we're ready to go. I said, you guys didn't get it. So they actually ended up capturing one of the other uh, players and we were using armbands back then. We didn't have uh, uh, uniforms. So they actually captured one of the players and they switched armbands. <laughs> and they sent the guy in, but he was recognized. So they sent him in as a spy. And it was funny as shit because everyone was watching him. And he's thinking he's over there and he's like walking around. And, you know, we're letting him look at another computer. And he's trying to figure out how to grab it. And we had the, the real computer they need was actually in a hut. And it was actually inside the hut. And he never went inside there. So he grabs the next computer and we let him run away with it. And we get a, get a call of the radio again. Hey, we're ready to extract. And I go, you guys don't have the, you guys don't have the computer. <laughs> so that's what I get. I get a call over the radio from the, the guy who's over at Respawn. They're like, he's like, dude, fucking, they're pissed off, man. They, they're like, how many fucking, or I'm, I'm sorry for swearing on here. How many computers do they got? So I ended up having to go out and talk to the guys. And I said, look, when you guys go in, you got to search. So they ended up coming back, doing a whole battle. But it, it was a lesson learned that they'll never forget to this day, um, that when you play a game, you better go in and you better search and you better look around and you better not just grab the thing that's closest. Right. So when I do these scenarios, I put through people through their bases, paces, and I, I, as an event organizer over, you know, having done this for 12 years, I've had to gauge, gauge the players. How much can they take? Because uh, sometimes you can frustrate them too much. So you have to tone it down a little bit. Um, other times you can advance it. And, and part of the thing is uh, I've had to advance it and, and, and always step it up because people are always looking for something new. And we've used uh, improvised explosive devices um, with cell phones attached, uh, radios attached, trip wires, uh, real stuff that people would experience out in the field. Uh, role players uh, dealing with dealing with role players. We did that, you know, quite a bit at Climb to Glory when we were up at Fort Drum. Um, and I, you know, I gave uh, I gave these people a, a, a mission: go find, uh, go find the. Uh, you know, he was a head cleric and basically said, you know, he's a big guy with a, a beard and a mustache. And I gave him a black and white picture. And uh, these are, you know, this was this was after the fourth Pine Plains. We ran Climb to Glory up there. And Climb to Glory was 
this is one of the first times we got a, uh, I got away from using points. Um, and it was, it was, it was very immersive was climb to glory. And that was back in 2010. And what we did was I actually had the coalition force actually lived inside the mouth site. And they actually, the hotel at the mouth site up at, up at uh, Fort Drum was where the coalition base was. And they actually moved inside the hotel and lived inside of there. That's pretty cool. And um, the freedom fighters uh, actually ended up taking over one of the villages that was outside the mouth site. So what we did is, and when we had when we had the people come in, if you were a coalition, you checked in and you went to the hotel. If you were freedom fighters, you didn't you didn't stop there. So we didn't have the formations together. The coalition didn't know how many freedom fighters were actually out there, and you know, co you know, the freedom fighters had a better understanding of how many how many guys you know were on the coalition side. Um, but we had them parked separate. They were they were probably about a half mile apart from each other. We did the formation separately, and so it was a totally different uh, version, and um, it was more immersive. And that's you know that's one of the things that people have asked to get back into. And it's a special group um, that are looking to do that. So that was a twenty four hour immersive game where we actually started that Friday night. So it actually ended up going over twenty four hours. Because we started it Friday and we ran it until Sunday. And I would love to do an op like that. It was it was a lot of fun and it was it's it's great to to actually get people to that level um, and be able to do some of the stuff with that we did with that um, op. And I've had people ask me to start doing that type of thing again. And we've done twenty four hours up at uh, up in Massachusetts. We have an abandoned chemical factory up there. It's twenty eight acres. And all sorts of buildings and everything else like that. You can see some of that online. Um, and one of the things I actually have coming up that I'm, uh, I just got approval on, just cut the deal and everything else. I've got a 78-acre uh, uh, abandoned resort in the Poconos. Uh, it's not the same one John Lou was looking at. It's a different one. Uh, but it's 78 acres. It's got woods. It's got over 50 cabins, uh, two hotels. Uh, in other buildings. And because we're not be able to get back up to Fort Drum, this is the closest that I think I can bring to that experience where we can put people in there and we can give them that, you know, 28 hour, you know, plus experience. And they'll have woods, they got buildings, uh, they'll be able to maneuver, and we'll end up bringing in the role players. And I got, um, uh, Jeff Froelich, who was one of our commanders that we used up at Fort Drum, he was up at uh, he was at all the Pine Plains, both the ones I ran and the one Black Sheep ran as one of the commanders. He's coming down uh, for that. Uh, he's coming down for our uh, Operation DEFCON, uh, which is coming up in a couple of weeks out in uh, Long Island at the decommissioned nuclear power plant. Yes, sir. So I know I'm all over the place on the. No, no, that's good. That's good. We don't want to go there yet, though. We're gonna save that. We don't want to go there yet. But okay. Um, the poke that this kind of op that you're talking about it sounds really yeah. exciting. Um, it's funny you say that because you know um, Milsom West does that, and you know they're pretty new. I think it's been around for five or six years. You know, um, and uh, probably probably maybe a little less than that actually. But it, it's funny, you know, guys think that this is that's like a new concept. Like, oh, my God, the team starts separately. Oh, you actually stay here and, you know, you camp inside and the game starts at night. And, you know what I mean? That's, like, all, like, new concepts to guys. And it's been yeah. around for a long time. It was new. I thought it was new, yeah. you know, until you said it. And I had done some research before, you know, we talked. Yeah. You know, it, it's – and that's, that's like, that's where, you know, Milsim needs to go. Because I'll be honest with you. I'm a civilian, you know what yeah. I mean? I work for the Army. I want to experience that military monotony of like, man, when are they going to attack? And then you're like, they're not going to attack. Then they attack, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like the CO says, go move those boxes into the shed. You know, you're like, oh, uh, you know what I mean? Like that yeah. military thing that regular people don't get, like that's a big part of it. Um, not just the old action and go, 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 go. You know, sometimes it's like set up your campground, cook your food, you know, yeah. go, uh, do – a cool thing that I would love to do would be, uh, you know, set up rotating guards. You know what I mean? That's something that you can't do at a, at a well, standard op. So yeah, I think the, cl the climb to glory, 
uh, event really, really had all those features. Um, and what, what I did, it I had worked on, I had basically taken the stuff, uh, some of the best stuff we had from Pine Plains, and um, uh, I ended up changing the name when when Black Sheep and I separated, part of the agreement is neither of us would use Operation Pine Plains. And he kind of he kind of switched. He calls it Pine Plains or Black Sheep at Pine Plains. I don't know. He has it, I, but it's no big deal. We're cousins, and no big deal. <laughs> but uh, I ended up going with Climb to Glory. And so, having talked to the players and having been a player myself, and that's part of it. I, I've I've been playing for you know twelve plus years. And going back to the whole concept of how we came up with doing the 24-hour op was, I love John Liu, I love his events, and Irene was Irene was awesome. The thing I hated was it, at Zussman, that gravel road, walking from the from the mount site back to where we were we were parked, because he had basically it was like one or two buses, so you know we had what three four hundred players. So it was taking, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes to move all those players. So people started walking because it was like, I don't know, it's a half mile, a mile away. But it's like we just started gaining momentum. And up in the Northeast, we were used to going out into the field for the entire day. We weren't used to, small, you know, like short games. Up at Tolland, which is 300 acres, when we played up there – um, that was how it was. So the, we were used to the long games of going in, having all your stuff, and being out in the field for the entire day. You know, we'd go in at 9 o'clock and come out at, you know, 5 o'clock. And you didn't go to your car. You didn't have the brakes. And you maneuvered. You, you know, and that was part of the thing is could you maneuver, could you wear them down if they were at, you know, if they were in a, in a position, you attack, you wear them down, you know, and you try, to, you try different things. So from when we were doing, when, when we went down as a Northeast group down to Irene, we weren't used to the short scenarios where you play, you know, two, three, even four, four hours. That was short game for us. And so when, um, when we got the opportunity to go up to Fort Drum and run our own event, one of the things for me was, let's just do a 24 hours. That's what I was looking for as a player. And that's what all the other guys up here wanted. And um, so that's why we did it. And that's why we ended up uh, going to that level of a 24-hour op. And then what I did is for Climb to Glory, um, talking to the players up here again and being, you know, kind of what I'm looking for is going up to that next level, which was the immersion um, and stuff that happened. Because not everyone can make it up on Friday night. So what we did is we gave people who wanted to play Friday night, we gave them that option. And that went back to when 12 years ago when I was running Battle for Tallinn and we had the first night game, you know, Friday night game. And what happened during that game ended up relating into the next day. Okay. And so that's what we did um, for Friday night. We actually let a lot of people just want to come in, check in, um, and they checked into the hotel, like I said, or, the you know, the Freedom Fighters ended up going down you know, to their village. And uh, anyone who wanted to run special missions, we actually started the special missions Friday night for anyone who wanted to actually do that. And then we kind of just related whatever happened on those. Uh, I think we stopped them at four o'clock in the morning um, and we had people break. And then we, cause then we ended up having to do formations and stuff like that Saturday morning for the main group. And we were actually still checking some people in. But anyone who wanted to play, we let them play. We let people do stuff Friday night. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, one of the things with getting Freedom Fighters involved was we didn't want to give them night vision equipment. You know, there, we had guys on there who had night vision equipment, but it didn't make sense because we were doing it as an Afghan-based theme, you know, right. back in 2010. So we were going with that Afghan, you know, or Iraqi-themed. And, you know, those guys didn't have, have night vision. So what we did as a compromise was we allowed the Freedom Fighters to raid the mouth site Friday night and come in under the cover of darkness, and they actually had to find a crate that signified them stealing night vision from the coalition forces. Ah, okay, cool. So after they did that, 
then any player who was on that side would be allowed to use the night vision uh, that they had. So there were players over there that had it, and basically what we said is, you guys got to go get it. And uh, they did. And that, you know, gave them an incentive to, to actually go in, find the crate, and, you know, controlling them outside Friday night with not the entire force. And you talked about having, having to set up guards. Um, they did. They set up the guards, but the uh, freedom fighters were actually able to come in. And uh, you just, you know, it was one of those diversion tactics, you know, attack from one side and send, you know, you only needed two or three guys to sneak in and go after and get the, get the crate and sneak out. So it was a uh, so so that was like a it was kind of like either you get it or you don't. If you don't get it, no nods for you, no night vision device for you. They they would have had the entire rest of Saturday during the day to continue getting to them to try to capture it. Yeah. Okay, okay. But they were able to get them Friday night so that you know can't come the next day they actually already had access to them and they started using them Friday night. Good, good, good. So that was probably a lot of fun to do that to yeah. run that little mission. Awesome. Very it cool. gives them it gives them incentives um, to do that. I mean, one of the things is we ended up doing them on on marches where they actually ended up running into ambushes. Um, one of the things that that frustrated some of these guys was we actually sent them out on a mission, and when the when the coalition forces got there, uh, and we were, I, I ended up some of you telling me the uh, uh, Milsim West was doing the trucks with the. Uh, you know, as part of the, uh, uh, like an air assault type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we, we, were, we did that. Um, that's how we moved people around up at Fort Drum was, uh, was the whole concept of, you know, you guys are in a, you know, helicopter. We kind of shoved them in there. We, we actually had the, uh, had the helicopter music and nobody wanted it. They were, they were like, it's too loud. And they shut off the, shut off the music that was inside the uh, back of the box truck. They didn't want it. Um, <laughs> But uh, we ended up sending the coalition group out, and they got out there, and they had to deal with a role player. So while they're dealing with the role player, the, um, they ended up going on a mission, and there was nothing there. And, and they, they were like, they finally said, look, we've been out here for an hour. We've searched the whole area. There's nothing here. And we said, all right, when are you coming back? And they were just like, what do you mean? We were supposed to fight people. And it's what we told them is you did it. The, you went, you had bad Intel, you went, you searched and you have to come back. And they're like, well, that's not how these games are supposed to go. And like, <laughs> what we're doing is we're giving you actually a real life scenario. Yeah. That's, that's, that's life, buddy. <laughs> but what ended up happening? Why they had their group out there? The freedom fighters were end up able to ended up attacking the main mount site, and then they ended up having to call their forces back uh, to help support the attack that was going on. So they had gotten bad intel from uh, from a local who was a role player, who gave them some intel that was sending them off on a wild goose chase for no reason other than to keep them away from the mount site. Right. And uh, so it's different things like that that we've tried in the past. It's fun. It's, you know, and uh, actually when they were driving back in the back of the truck, the guy that they were searching for, we actually had him standing on the side of the road. <clears throat> and <laughs> they couldn't get out of the truck, and he just waved to them. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so they were a little frustrated. But it, what we were trying to do is give them a real-life scenario. And what I do is I – uh, the guys who are my leadership um, ha are combat experience guys, and uh, people people that we have leading. And what we do is we try to not only have these guys who have real world experience have combat experience, um, because they bring something special to this, and the, and the players really like to like to work alongside these guys. And it's great getting missions from them of things that have happened to them. And the, the, the odd missions that have happened are some of the best ones. And uh, so we use real-life stuff from stories that these guys have told us. And what we also do is we kind of bring in um, an air softer as well because one of the toughest things um, that I run into is when we bring on a new 
combat or, or military guy is they're not used to to sacrificing airsoft players right and they want it they want it they play a little bit too close um because they they don't want people to die and what i tell them is it's okay to send these guys in and do stuff that you may not have done in the real military i said it's it's kind of like used more of along the lines of the russian techniques where uh, you can send a squad out, and if they get killed, you know what? It's not necessarily that bad. They're going to get, you know, they're going to come back in in, you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, we're not looking to just throw bodies out there. We're not, you know, we're, we're, we're using tactics and techniques. Um, but there there's some things, you know, this, it is simulation. It is a game. These guys are are looking for for firefights. They're looking to get engaged and shoot each other. And that's what they want. Um, you know, it, we actually were going to bring in a Navy SEAL. And, it, and if we went by their tactics or even Delta Force or something like that, part of their thing is to go in, complete the mission, and get out without ever firing a shot. And we, right. we've actually run missions like that where, you know, go in, do recon, come back, and then we'll send in the main battle force. Right. And, and that would be awesome to me, I think. That would be that would be cool. That would be really cool. Now, now you've kind of said the the hot button word there, um, Delta Force. Yep. So let's 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 quickly this is let's let's jump to this. Now this I feel like is a real airsoft coup here. You know you've kind of captured the big fish. Um, you are going to have a, a former Delta Force operator as a CEO at your upcoming op. Okay, Operation. Uh, it's, it's Operation Defcon, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Now, who who is that? Who is this man you're gonna well, have? Here? We got uh, I was able to get in contact with uh, you know, Del Dale Comstock, you know, former Delta Force operative, um, who's you know after he left Delta Force, he he's been engaged in in every battle and everything else that's that's been involved since you know in in various uh, various manners. Um, great guy, and uh, it's gonna bring an exciting new level. Um, to this, uh, having having that next level up. Now, now having said that, um, one of our original guys who who I started this with, uh, his his call sign was Casca, and Casca unfortunately is no longer with us. But he was um, he was one of the black op guys. He was with uh, um, some people call it Ground Branch. Uh, some, you know, he called it, uh, he said some people called it, uh, the secret army of Northern Virginia and his, the official thing that the military calls it is SOLIC, special operations, low, low intensity conflict. So, uh, Casca is no longer here, but he did stuff that was sort of black ops style, style thing. So he was doing special operations, um, stuff and in working with us up here in the northeast for years but it wasn't something people know about you know? did that influence um back then did that that influence the structure how you structured the ops oh absolutely yeah okay. he was he was one of the when when we ran pine plains too it was myself black sheep and casca who actually the three of us it took all three of us to pull off operation pine plains and if you know it it really required all three of us to do that. And then we ended up, you know, advancing on that. And Casca has or had the combat experience. He was a 25 year combat vet. Um, he'd been in, uh, started off in 82nd and then uh, got involved in the special operations community. And he ended up um, 10 years in the military in special operations. Uh, community and then he left for 10 years uh, and did private military contracting um, for Iraq and Afghanistan and, and doing that stuff and we say he tired, got tired of getting shot at and actually ended up going back in under uh, the Vermont National Guard as a human intelligence uh, operative and for some people don't know what that is they're the ones who actually hunt the uh, the Taliban and they're the ones who, who go out and hunt those guys and then question them to get the human intelligence, um, that other people are able to use. 
So Casco is an awesome guy, gave us incredible uh, knowledge. And I worked very closely with him uh, to try bringing realism uh, to this. And, and he knew how the whole Milsim thing was. And one of the great things about him is they actually, he told the story of how they actually used airsoft guns when he was um, going from Kuwait into Iraq when he was a pr private military contractor and they didn't get their guns yet. And they ended up, <laughs> uh, st they had their airsoft guns. They put, you know, they got rid of the flat, you know, the orange tip on them. And uh, they drove and they stuck those airsoft guns out, <laughs> out, the, out the suburban windows and they drove into Iraq with airsoft guns. I uh, figured nobody was going to shoot at them because they figured they were in the black <laughs> suburbans and they had guns sticking out the windows. So he was, uh, he was one of the first guys I met, and he actually used Airsoft and Milsim, and, and that's, uh, he used it as a training tool um, to help when he was home. And so we had, a, we had an incredible benefit with that. And now, fortunately, for us and for the Airsoft community, Dale Comstock has now come on board. He's coming on board with us for, uh, for Operation DEF CON. We're super excited to have him on board for that. Uh, he's got his book out, American Badass, which is, uh, I've read it. It's a great read. And uh, we're just, you know, we're excited about having him come on board and, and bring that, that message that he has from the military and from the private community that he's been working in on board with us. And, uh, you know, we, we have some great things that we're, we're really looking forward to, to bringing him on board for that and to have the opportunity to actually use a decommissioned uh, nuclear power plant in Long Island. It's never been used. Um, I know they got the one down in South Carolina, but that actually wasn't a power plant. And this is what I've told people. I've actually gone there and visited, and it's a fortress. And nothing like this has actually been used yet in military simulation or airsoft or whatever you want to call it. It's an incredible 3D environment. It's a true fortress, and it was meant to keep radioactivity waves in and people out. And inside of that, it has short corners. It's, it's going to be one of the toughest locations that people are ever going to fight for. And it actually has to be one of the best locations for what we do in Airsoft, where you actually have to go in with small arms and take it. It's unlike other locations where you bring in mortars or bring in, you know, where people want to simulate mortar attacks, which we which we do at some events, uh, simulate an airstrike or something like that. You can't do that on a nuclear facility if you're trying to take it back. You actually got to go in there and fight for it. You can't, like, blow that nuclear facility up. If it was a real nuclear power plant, you got to go in there and you got to take it back with people and rifles. And that's what we're going to require these people to do. Very cool. Very cool. So this is going to be, this is, is this going to be, uh, is this, do you think this is going to be like challenging for you guys who normally do like kind of, uh, a really big kind of like, you know, take the city or, you know, we're going across this wide t amount of terrain or, you know, for you guys, this is like just old hat, you know, uh, no, no this is deal. what I'm, I'm running this a little bit different and I run, I run events different based on the AO. Um, because you just can't run everything the same. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Right. Right. And, um, so each, each AO is unique. Um, a lot of our, a lot of our stuff is similar. A lot of our rules and everything, you know, you, you know, you get the same rules and stuff like that, but the, uh, the AO on this one is going to, what I'm doing is it's going to be real heavy mission based. And what we're going to do is because of the opportunity of having Dale there and actually bringing down Jeff Froelich who's been up at Pine Plains with us forever. And uh, he's, got a, he's got a great resume as well. Um, having the players have the opportunity to work with these, these commanders, what I want them to do is we're going to give them a mission. They're going to have time to do mission planning. Then it's execute, and they're going to be given a certain amount of time to execute that plan. And then they're going to go back and they're going to do AARs with their commanders. Then we're going to immediately give them another mission, mission planning, execution, AAR. 
So it's going to be continuous in that manner, but it's not go in, take this building and hold, you know, the second floor. You know, we're going from uh, 10 o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night on Saturday. Uh, and then we're, we have to leave the AO. We can't run 24 hours there because of the neighbors and, you know, just the, uh, the way the structure is and everything else like that. It's not a 24 hour location. So we're, we're running until nine o'clock at night and then we're coming back on Sunday and we're going to start up doing it again, but it's going to be a lot of close quarter three. It's a true 360 environment where you can shoot through these metal grates. And, um, like I said, the close combat will, will really wear on people. Although you can maneuver outside, there's only maybe four openings to get inside that building. And, and as I said, it's a fortress and it's designed to keep people out. So it's, it's going to test these guys. And we will have role players involved for the different scenarios. Everything from uh, uh, factory workers uh, who are going to be there. And we're, we're basing it off of a, um, a Ukraine situa situation where the nuclear okay. power plant is in the Ukraine. Freedom fighters are, um, you know, Russian-based, and the coalition force are more NATO-based. Both of them are trying to make sure they secure this U uh, Ukrainian power plant. So there's a scenario and there's a storyline behind it. Um, the factory workers may be Ukrainian um, loyalists, or they could be more Russian. You're not going to know. So it's some of the things you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have engineers inside, nuclear engineers that you're going to need. Um, I got somebody who's writing a computer program that they're going to need to get this guy and, you know, get passwords and actually actually get into the computer program that I have written. Uh, one of the role players uh, is taking courses on writing computer programs. He's actually writing a computer program for this scenario. <laughs> nice. Um, so we're bringing that in. So it's not just a regular laptop that's a prop but you're actually going to have to use the computer itself uh, to, to, as part of the mission. Um, and then, of course, by the way, we'll also have some terrorists and weapons purchasers coming in trying to buy some, uh, some nuclear material for dirty bombs. So you got all sorts of, all sorts of scenarios that will be taking place, role players, getting engineers, and at the same time, you got, you got to fight, fight each other and uh, do this. So it'll be heavy mission-oriented uh, for this, this AO. But having the opportunity, and you know, like I said, I've been to, been to John Lewis games, and I was fortunate because I was a platoon leader, and so I got to uh, work with Colonel McKnight on, you know, at a high level. And most people don't get that opportunity. I, you know, I got an opportunity to work with Bubba, and great guy. These guys are great guys, and a lot right. of airsoft players don't get that opportunity. They get to see them, they get to take pictures, but they don't get that interaction. Right. That's one of the things that I wanted, having experienced it myself. I wanted people who come to my events to be able to have that opportunity because getting the opportunity to work and, and talk and plan a mission alongside Dale Comstock um, is a, is very rare. Oh, that's great. That'd be awesome. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Ah! That's part of things where, you know, we want to give, you know, so it's not only bringing in these VIPs, but actually being able to interact with them and actually work with them, squad leaders, you know, and yeah, you get to fight alongside of them, but actually planning a mission. And so that's why I did this one real heavy where it's mission based, because I want players to have that interaction with these VIPs that they'd never get an opportunity to deal with otherwise. Right. And then executing the mission. And one of the things I've told all the players, because this is a nuclear power plant, it's concrete, steel. And what they have to understand is there's, there's lead inside that concrete. Radio communication inside that building is going to be very limited at best. So when you got 200 people and, you know, running in there and not knowing what's going on, if we don't bring them out occasionally, you're going to have people who are lost and don't know what's going on. And it's a big facility. And so that's another reason it's going to be mission-based. Um, you know, find out what you did. Learn, make, turn this into a learning. It's not just a an op, but part of MSATO, and I, I don't know if it says, but MSATO is military simulation, airsoft training and operations. So yes, it's an operation, but if you're looking to learn anything, you have a great opportunity 
to have a Delta Force guy. Um, and even on the coalition side, we've got great COs over there, special forces, you know, trained and jungle training and, and everything else. And these guys know what they're talking about. Come out, you know, learn, do it, do it quick. Even if it's a 15, 20 minute AAR. What was the good, bad and ugly? And let's not repeat it on the next mission. Right. So that's part of what we're looking at. DEF CON is going to be cool. Um, we got some other stuff coming up for 2015. As I said, we got the Poconos Resort. We're going to be back up at uh, Abandoned Chemical Factory. Um, I got another location down in Rhode Island. We're probably just going to do a one-day game on that. It's 40 acres of industrial facility. Um, I got other locations. It's, it's, I'm not sure how far I want to reach outside the Northeast. I got some other uh, activities that I'm involved in um, that I'm trying to bring Airsoft up to the next level and bring it out to the public a little bit more in a positive manner. Right. One of the big things that, that, that we came across years ago, and uh, I hear, you know, I was talking to Greg Brothers, he said, it doesn't matter what event you go to, just go out. I don't, yeah. If you don't come to mine, go to John's, go to Black Sheep, go to American Milson, go to American Milson West. Give us the feedback. As event organizers, we want your feedback. Tell us what you're looking for. You know, we can adapt things. Now, sir, you know, yeah, we, we have our own style, and that's what's great about us. And it's great for the players. We have all these options. And right now, it's, it's an awesome time for the players. You got John Lewis going around. He's got, you know, great AOs, Black Sheeps out there, American Milson, American Milson West. And there's other ones that, that I even haven't even heard of. Um, and a lot of people haven't heard of ours. And as you said, I appreciate you having us on. And it's a, it's a great opportunity to, you know, take care of us in the Northeast. And if we get, if we get requests, I've got locations down in Florida. I've got a look, I've got three locations out in California I can use. Uh, South Carolina, I got a, I got a, a 50 acre industrial site outside of Chicago. Uh, that's just an incredible, uh, it's an abandoned industrial site on 50 acres. But in order for me to move outside the Northeast, there has to be a player base that can support it. Right. These are expensive. And, you know, people don't understand, like I said, people don't understand what it takes to get into these, these locations. And uh, getting into the New York location, it, it took months. And there was a lot of politics involved with, uh, you know, especially in New York. Yeah, I bet. Soft guns. Um, and a lot of players need to understand this, and I say this to, to everyone, is, and I tell some of the players, most property owners and Airsoft has a bad rep, and they really don't like us. And it's, and it's something that we're trying to give a positive image, and it's a struggle. Um, and when somebody does one thing wrong, that's what the news media picks up on. So we're trying to do a positive event. Like we got the West Point cadets coming down. They've they've come to three of my events. Uh, we got UConn Airsoft that's coming out. So when we're able to get these college teams, it puts us in a positive light. Um, one thing we you know is do is when players go to an organized field, go to an organized event. When you do it in your backyard, when you do it, you just bring negativity to the sport, and it hurts us across the board. All right. And the other thing I'd ask is, you know, uh, it's it's tough for us high-level event organizers to get these properties. If a regular player, I know you guys want to go out there and you want to go see the AO. If you're going on those properties on times that we're not supposed to be there, that's trespassing. And it pisses off the property owners and it puts us in jeopardy. And stay away from the locations except when we're allowed to be there. We pay money, and we pay a lot of money to be on that property. That's why we're allowed to be there. You can't just go on these properties, you know, and be like, oh, I want to run a game there. And you got these guys who are like, oh, I, I, I want to run a game there. They just don't get the insurance requirements, legitimate business, the cost of being on there. Yeah, so that, that happened to John Liu. That happened it, to John I, Liu in California. It happens all the time. And I, I actually had some people recently who were contacting the nuclear power plant. And it gets back to me, you know, and I, I learn, you know, we, we find out about it. And it just, we have to then talk and, and calm down the property owners 
um, and, it, and it puts us in a, in a bad situation. So I, I just, one thing I'd like to get out there, let us do it. Enjoy our events. Um, and we're, we're trying to put them on for you guys and try not to jeopardize these unique locations by going out and doing something stupid. I think it's a, and and on that note, I want to say this. I think it's important for guys to understand that you know, like you said, it costs a lot of money, but also tons of insurance issues. I'm sure this, I'm sure this nuclear power plant is not a place that you know they would, you know, it's. I'm sure it's not a super safe place. You know, it probably has holes in the floor all over the place and pitfalls and nuclear waste behind some sealed door. So, you know, it's probably the kind of place where you need lots of insurance and lots of assurances that things are going to be okay and a certain age player base, stuff like that. So, you know, I think it's important for guys to understand when a company like Imsato or Milsim West or American Milsim or John Liu, you know, they do their due diligence like crazy to make sure these places are safe. They go through and tape everything off. I know you guys do a lot of that to make sure players aren't falling through holes yeah. and stuff. So it, it's really important for you guys to do everything you can to respect the space when you're there and to not go when you're not supposed to be there. Uh, like, I, like I said, it happened to John Liu out there he almost lost the property out where they do line claws um, yeah. the big air at, at george air force base i think um you know you said it's happened to you um i know you know just as an example you know i think it's important you can't be a team of 12 guys and say we're going to host a 400 player op <laughs> randomly for the first time you know yeah. we know guys who tried to do it at big places the place out in georgia where uh I forgot the name of the group where those guys did that uh, that one big op yeah. uh, two years ago, and yeah. nothing happened. You know, it was a total flop, and nothing happened. So uh, it, it takes more than just uh, hopes, dreams, and candy cane to make this. You know, to make these <laughs> things come together. And you know, I, I agree with you. You know, if if you have a company and you're trying to start out, you know, maybe reach out to these guys and talk to them, let them, and get some advice. But don't just try to do it yourself. Don't, you know, I've heard so many places, so many people say, oh, we just host like these quiet little ninja ops where nobody knows and we just go to a place and have an airsoft game. You can't do yeah. that. You know, yeah. you can't do that, especially in this climate right now. All the stuff that happened in Ohio with the kid with the airsoft gun getting shot and then California. It's just like you can't do that stuff. You've got to be cognizant of your environment. You've got to. You know, you're going to ruin the sport for us. And, and you know, you raise a great point, uh, Tom, when you say that you guys will lose the ability to secure these great AOs that we love to play in because some goofball and his 12 buddies decided they're going to play an airsoft game. You know, they're going to hop the fence somewhere and go play an airsoft game. So that's really important. It's that's it's it's a huge factor. And, and, and a lot of people – you know, don't, don't understand. Everyone, everyone's heard of Pine Plains or a lot of people have heard of Pine Plains. They've seen the GMR videos and stuff like that. They, you know, that was something that, that we actually filmed and they were, you know, they were, they were working with me at, uh, at the time. And, uh, you know, we had, we ended up bringing up a, you know, high quality film crew and, and everything else. And, and we had a great videos up there. What ends up, you know, a lot of people, yes, yeah, sequester is a big factor and that's the official reality because i talk to the people up at fort drum because i have the relationship because i've run games up there and you know black sheep and i and, and what they tell us is official word is sequester and it's a 10-year term and that's what i've been told by by the base now the thing that you have to understand is it's easier for them to say no than it is to say yes right and what ends up happening after Pine Plains, it was funny because I ended up, I saw somebody, somebody was blaming GMR for us not being able to go up there anymore, you know, because they were breaking it and this and that. So, you know, and, and again, you get the whole, you know, internet thing and it's just people talking out their butt because they just don't know the, the real story. And a lot of it has to do is official word is sequester. Reality, when I can go up there, when black sheep can go up there, and then other people started going up and asking if they could come on base. You had paintballers who wanted to get on base because the paintballers were complaining, how can you let the airsofters use it? And then you had other people who started contacting them. And then what ended up happening is it ends up putting stress on the base, 
uh, on the people you, who actually take care of it right. at the base. So they end up having to answer questions. And, you know, once a month, they're having to deal with people. And then what they have to do is they have to vet the people. So now it takes some time to vet that organization to see if they're, if they can actually, if they have the insurance, are they a legitimate business? Do they have everything in order? That's a vetting process that takes time. So if, if every month somebody's contacting them and saying, Hey, we want to run it, you know, cause black sheep ran a game up there and Sato run a game. So you got to let us run a game. So the military gets to a point and they say, you know what, if we tell everybody no, then we don't have to, anyone calls up and says, hey, we want to run an airsoft game or we want to run a paintball game. The easiest thing for them to do now is they pick up the phone and they say, no, 10 years. That's what it is. Yep. And that's the biggest issue about us not getting uh, Fort Drum because you had all these other groups and these small organizations that had to get vetted because we ran location, you know, we ran our games up there and we had a good thing going, but it takes the military time to start vetting. Yeah. And it, and it costs them money to do that because it's taking them away from other stuff. Yeah. yeah. And in, in whether you, people do that at other locations, property owners will get to the point where it's easier to say no than it is to go through the vetting process of, of trying to get, you know, trying to get in there. I, I can tell you guys. Uh, let me interrupt you real quick, Thomas, because um, I think it's. I think that's another factor. Guys don't understand. Um, <clears throat> I work for the U.S. Army. Okay, I work on a base. Yep. Okay, I know exactly. I know the military mindset when it comes to this stuff. All right, because I've asked about this stuff. Because I, like I said, I work on a base. Mm -hmm. All right, and they would much rather say no than say anything else yep. because then they have to think about it. And guess what? People are living and dying based on the training they're giving out, the weapons they're doing, whatever. And you know what? They're not a business. They don't need the money. You know, yeah. they don't need they don't need your airsoft game. All they have to do is make not. sure the guards the guard the guard is getting trained, and the soldiers who need to come in and get their training are can get their training, and not run into paintballs and BBs everywhere. So you know, they would much rather. It's easy to say no, and you're you know. So that's that's the thing. I completely understand what you happen what you're saying, and it's it's a delicate balance. So we all also we have to think. Yeah, okay, Black Sheep, you know, and uh, you know, Msato, you know, they have that location, whatever, you know. But we have to be cognizant of the fact that you know, hey, we all play the sport, we all love the sport, you know. Let's try to you know, be respectful of these places. And not be like, it was a great op. I want to go there with 16 of us, you know. It's not going to work. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that, Thomas. Go ahead. No, it's true. That's And that's really it. You know, it's uh, I just want to get that out there because, you know, there, there's been misconceptions, um, you know, about, you know, not being able to use Fort Drum anymore. There's multiple reasons. Um, but that's a big factor. That's a, that's a huge factor with them was people – you know, contacting them and them having to go through the process. And uh, they said it's easier to say no to everybody than to say yes to one person right now. Right. And we've been told, I've been told, I know Black Sheep's been told, uh, the sequester is eight more years left now uh, on it. And they said the chances of, of them changing their mind are pretty slim. So. Fort Drum, you know, is a great place. Will it will it come around in the future? It's possible. But at the same time, you know, we have other opportunities. You know, I've I've moved into, uh, you know, what we call the real world uh, AOs, you know, the nuclear power plant, the chemical factory, the abandoned industrial sites, this resort that we have coming up. And we can give a lot of the same experience that we had up there. Um. 78 acres with a bunch of buildings we're going to give people that experience and we're excited about that and uh you know it, it'll give people a similar experience to the to what they had up at fort drum with uh on a different scale uh, and it's going to be a real world environment right so i just basically i got to pick a date on that and i've been trying to you know everyone's posting up their dates and you know john john lou's got his and you know i'm trying to as a player, and I actually, I, I, I try to go to John Lewis or so I go to the one up here in the Northeast because I, you know, I don't travel that much anymore because <laughs> if I can go to one up here. So um, a lot of times I'll hit John Lewis once a year because I like to go and be a player still. Um, but 
knowing that and the cost that these that the you know what we call these big big events are in order to put them on we have to charge um but i know the players can only afford so much and so that's why i'm trying to trying to spread it out so that we're not piling them on and being like okay you know oh two weeks we got another one or even next month you know it, there's a cost associated with it more than just the entrance fee oh sure yeah absolutely no no you're absolutely right i'm I have to. I'm driving 15 hours to uh, your cousin's op in in like a week and a half or two weeks. So, um, yep. yeah, it it gets uh, it gets pretty crazy in the cost and everything else. And 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 a lot of guys complain about the big op promoters. Oh, John Lou's charging two hundred dollars. Oh, this that other thing, you know. And here's the thing, you know, these locations, man, they're not free. You know, it's just simple as that. They're not free. You know, there's no other explanation needed. It's not a free place to play. <coughs> I, um, you know, we, we, you know, none of us like to, sh you know, share numbers or anything, but I can tell you when we ran Pine Plains, the first Pine Plains, um, I paid to make that event happen because we got, we got 90 guys. So I went in the hole on that one with the understanding that, you know, we want to build it up and turn it into a real event. Um, and fortunately we were able to now Pine Plains two, you know, worked out well cause we ended up having like 400 players, you know, so it ended up being, it ended up being good. Now Pine Plains three, we, you know, cause we ran Pine Plains two in the, in the spring. So we had, we had a, a great player base. Pine Plains three, I ended up running that one at a loss again, cause we had under 200 players and, um, a lot of, a lot of, Promoters have different numbers. Um, for me, 200 is really a key number um, because of how I run it. You know, it, once I get to 200, you know, I can break even. Um, you know, but, and I know John's, at, you know, everyone's at a different level because of how they do staffing and everything else um, and, and everything that's associated with it. But they think that we're, you know, they, they, that's what I said. They have no idea the, the costs and the, you know, paying people and, and it, people are just, you know, for, for my events, I don't, you know, I, I got people coming in and, and we, we pay them. Um, they're there to support you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just part of the thing. And we do it. If we didn't love the sport, this is the worst business model you could ever get into. And I would tell anyone that, you know, that run the airsoft store, run a local field, run, local fields, you're going to do, you're going to make more money running a local field than you do running these big events. People take the number of, uh, number of players, multiply it by the, uh, the entrance fee, and they think that's what we're making. And that's so far from the truth that it, it, if any one of us went to a bank and said, hey, we want to get a loan, and they looked at our records there's not one bank that would give one national event organizer a loan on our businesses because it's not a, you do it because you love it. Right. Right. And that that's what we do it for. No, that that's what you know, I've, I've talked to Greg and stuff like that. And, you know, he's told me kind of like off the record, you know, that, you know, not any numbers, but he's like, you know, they you know, they're breaking even, you know, none of none of these things are, you know, it's just like John Liu. He loves to host events. He loves the he loves the airsoft. He loves the military. He he does it because he loves it. So he loves those events. They're breaking even. You know the American Milsim guys. They're breaking even. Like everybody's breaking even. Nobody's getting rich off of this. No one has become independently wealthy. <laughs> you know none. Of, we're not seeing cribs, uh, M Sado. You know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> M Sado <laughs> cribs. You know it's just not happening because you know you guys are just you're hosting the event. You know you're and you're trying to space them out. You know you're trying to respect all the other vendors. It's like so many puzzle pieces to this whole game. Yep. And I wish guys understood this um you know doing what i do i get to talk to lots of promoters lots of event organizers lots of fields and all kinds of stuff and nobody is getting in like wealthy off of this you know what i mean you say why don't you guys have uh real hueys flying in and say well that costs you know five thousand dollars an hour plus jet fuel plus, you know what i mean why can't we parachute into this game i mean you could look they they tried to do that down south you know and they yeah. got you know, we sent a guy, we, one of our promoters went down, one of our, uh, one of the guys who were on the show went down there. It cost $800 for him to go down at, to, to the jump school 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was only five guys there. Yeah. And it was such a loss that they couldn't do it again. You know, and it's really sad because they were given, you know, if you could, if you qualified, you got jump wings and you got to jump into an op. I mean, it was just so cool, but they couldn't get enough guys to do it because of the cost. And it, it, it just cost them too much money, you know, so it's we got to support these events you know if it's and i and it's the same thing that people say when they say shop local you know um i always tell guys to travel to good events um but i think it's really important to like in your case and i know the northeast is like a family so i know you don't have to worry about that northeast guys are like super loyal when it comes to like their ops their fields their game, the places they play airsoft, their CQBs, like they're they're loyal. They're like a tight knit family, and that's great. But you know, I think it's important for guys to go out. You know, they go to a John Lou event, go to this event, go to that event. You know, and just see them all. You know, because these, you know, even though it's an intricate, it's a delicate balance between vendors, corporations, event promoters. Uh, you know media youtubers you know it's all this like all these pieces that come together to keep the the sport self perpetuating along with the players who go to the events so you know it's it's all a big big puzzle it's, it's, <laughs> it's a high you know one of the things that you, the funny thing is one of the things you're talking about is um you so M Sato and I've been running games for you know probably I guess 12 years whatever you know whatever the the case may be um but there's a high turnover rate you know, and, and like, uh, we ran, it's funny when you, you brought up about the, the parachuting in, I actually had that, uh, set up and we were actually going to do it at, at one of the, I think it was bow for Tallinn three. Um, and because of the wind, um, up where we were, we, they couldn't, uh, we couldn't, we couldn't have the jumpers come in. We were, what I, we were doing is we were actually, I was using tandem. Uh, so oh, players cool. were going to be, uh, coming in, um, on, uh, on a tandem uh, uh, parachute um, with some sky, you know, with the skydivers. So that's how we were going to do it. Is we were actually going to have guys on uh, on tandem rigs uh, coming in because we had 90 acres of an orchard and we had a we had an LZ and everything else like that. So the National Guard used to train and bring in their helicopters. So we had it. We had a great location and and stuff like that. And uh, you know, even back then, I was bringing in armored vehicles and. Um, you know, I, we have a, a military museum up here that actually allowed me to bring in um, some of the armored vehicles, but to transport them, you know, we had to put them on the back of a, a, a semi truck, you know, flatbed in order to get them up to the field. And uh, again, it, you know, I, I've been at the, I've been at the point where we actually, I was actually going to run a, uh, a real high end for some corporate executives they asked me to, to, to put it together. And I had uh, a team of Navy SEALs out in San Diego, uh, retired SEALs that, you know, that do this for, you know, for corporate events and stuff. And it's basically, it was basically going to cost about $5,000 per person. And it was a weekend event and it included helicopter insertions. It included, you know, everything that people dream of is what these executives were looking for. You know, um, role players, actors, like legitimate actors and actresses in there you know, splurting blood, you know, where we were going to bring in, you know, uh, prop people from the film industry. And um, we can, I can get anything, you know, we can do whatever, <laughs> you know, like I said, we told, you know, people are like, what's it going to cost? Tell us what your budget is and we'll tell you. But if you're telling me you want to do multiple helicopter insertions and you want to have, you know, a, a hospital that you're going to go into, and you want to land on the roof and do all that? Well, you know what? I can do it. Can I? Can I get that done? Absolutely. I've I've actually had it all set up to do it, and then the guys backed out because it's like you, they kept asking for more and more, and it's like you know if you guys want to pay five thousand dollars, I'll get you a Navy SEAL team with helicopter insurgents and boat you know coming in on Zodiac boats and doing a beach landing. If you guys got the money, I'll make it happen. Right. It's not a problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> Jeez. That, that's crazy, man. That's that, you know, that's akin to some of the guys who go out to Sweden to play. And I'm just like, wow, I wish I could wish I had three grand to like ship a bunch of guns, gear myself over to Sweden, <laughs> you know, for the for for a weekend. You know, I mean, I wish I could do that. Um, But uh, wow, that's crazy. That's something else. Well, 
let, let's talk about something else here that you guys are passionate about. You've got it on your hat there. Um, yeah. the Lone, <laughs> Lone, Lone Survivor Foundation. Tell us a bit. You guys are, you guys are supporters of that. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what you guys do there. That's, that's a, that's a sad story for me. <laughs> oh, we don't have to talk about it if you don't want. Um, it's just, it's per, it's, it's something personal, right. but, it, the reason we support them is because of Casca. Um, he, he got support from them when nobody else was helping him. And uh, it's, a, it's a sad story about how he passed. But he had PTSD. And uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's, no, that's, that's all right. Like it's, I said, uh, they said it, it, we support, you know, players with that. And, and, and we think that there, you know, there's a legitimacy to it. Um, we've been supporting M. Sato has supported uh, veteran organizations from back, back at Pine Plains. Um, one of the things that was important to me was to give back. And, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was at Pine Plains, we wanted the players to actually fight for a cause. And by that, we actually, um, we actually had one team fighting for Wounded Warrior Project and the other team fought for Homes for Our Troops. And what, what we did is I went out to uh, sponsors, which were the you know, local airsoft vendors and stuff like that, and uh, said, you know what, I, as – I don't want you to write a check to M Sato to come up and be a sponsor. I want you to come up, sell your stuff, make money. But what I want you to do is I want you to write the check to the charity. And what we did was um, the winning team, because we at Pine Plains, we were doing a you know, scoring, scoring system with points. And what we said to the players, this is 24 hours. Suck it up for 24 hours. Because these guys do it for their life. And, you know, you guys want to go back and sleep in your car, or go back and go to, you know, uh, we're going to leave the base and go to the hotel. We had some players do that. And, we, you know, I think it was around Pine Plains 3. We said, you know what? Suck it up. You guys want the Milsom experience? Suck it up because that's what these guys do for a living. And uh, they go out. And they don't get to go home after 24 hours. You guys are doing it for 24 hours. So do it, you know? Yeah, it's going to be tough on you, but you get to leave. You get to go home and go home to your bed and, and rest up, you know, for the next day. Take the day off and, and stay home from work. So that was, that was one of the big issues for us. And then we supported them. We supported um, uh, Climb to Glory Foundation, which is a, the local thing up at Fort Drum, which supports the families for the soldiers who are away. And getting back to Lone Survivor, what ended up happening is Casca ended up getting diagnosed with PTSD. And uh, when, when that happened, the military screwed him over. Uh, they took away his security clearance. And he went to the VA. They didn't, you know, they, they shuffled him, I think, within uh, two months or something like that. They gave him, like, five different uh, therapists. And they just wanted to drug him up. And he was, he was like, you know, that's not, I'm not, I didn't come to tell you I have PTSD and traumatic brain injury because he'd been in multiple IED explosions. Um, he didn't just want drugs. He wanted help. And he wanted support. And I know the Wounded Warrior Project does, does good for a lot of people. But when he asked them for help, they didn't help him. And one of his buddies got him into Lone Survivor and he went down to Texas and he said it was the greatest experience that, that helped him. And so that's why we support him. Okay. That's great. That's great. Well, that's a, that's a, it's a great foundation, you know, and I'll have guys, I'll have links to all their stuff. So, you know, <clears throat> you can check them out and uh, throw them a donation over there. I uh, definitely want to support that. Um, definitely a good cause. And, you know, that, I think that's what every airsofter, milsimmer, 
you know, that you, you, you raised a great point there. When, when we go to an op, you know, a 24-hour op that guys aren't prepared for, you know, everyone flees back to their car. You know, they're cooking burgers behind their trunk and it's stuff, yeah. you know, and the thing is, you know, those guys can't do that. You know, they, they keep, you're absolutely right. They can't do that. They're in a trench, sweating, hoping that this isn't their last night on earth, you know, so they can move forward to the next day to get into another dangerous situation. So if they're even that lucky. So um, you're absolutely right. And and I think... I was gonna, I'm sorry. One of the things we... we... We force people to uh, to donate as part of you know if you if you sign up for uh, for an MSATO event, um, we t we we require everyone to to at minimum we we tack on an extra five dollars onto everyone's admission, and then we end up MSATO ends up giving money in addition to what we collect from the uh, from the players, but part of that is I want every player who comes to our event to not only say okay you know what I had a good experience. But it's funny, they'll, they'll complain about the price, but when we tell them, you know what, every person who's standing here at Formation, every one of you directly supported Lone Survivor Foundation because we write a check at the end of the event and we send it off to Lone Survivor and we get back the letter saying, you know, and, and we have letters from everyone. And, and that's one of the things, you know, I, if people are going to do it, if, if you're going to collect money or you're going to do something, you better support the foundation that you're doing it for and, and make that, make that donation. Because these guys who, who are in these organizations like Lone Survivor, so they, they help, you know, they literally help soldiers with PTSD and they support them. We've sold t-shirts, you know, for Casca and, and stuff like that. And, you know, and I, and I know John Liu, you know, he writes a check to that Wounded Warrior Foundation. You know, when people ask, where's the money go? When he's writing a check for $10,000. Yeah. That's huge. That goes a long way. And that, that's, that supports the Special Operations Foundation. You know, and when, when we write checks for 1000 or $2,000 to, you know, Lone Survivor, you know, that's allowing not only a soldier with PTSD to go down there, but it also brings their family in. And uh, our buddy Casca, before, you know, before he passed, he was a spokesman for Lone Survivor. And he went to their Chicago, uh, Chicago event. And um, after he went and got, you know, when, when he went and got help down in Texas, they, you know, they loved his story and they wanted to bring him on. And he actually went out to Chicago for their gala and they brought his family out there. And that was one of the last times he got to really spend a great time with his family. And they just had it. And he told me it was one of the best experiences he had had since being diagnosed with PTSD and traumatic brain injury. So, you know, support the causes and make sure the money's going to the vets. Um, they need it. You know, we support them. And I, you know, I can't, can't say enough about it. Um, it's a great cause. Lone Survivor, any of the other foundations that, you know, that where it's really going. And I know there's talk about Wounded Warrior whether how much actually goes to the to, goes to the people or not, look it up. Do your research, research anyone, and make sure that the money's getting to where it's supposed to be going. All right. Um, and that's you know I'm not, I don't I, you know I haven't done research on Wounded Warrior recently or or anyone else. Uh, we support Lone Survivor for for specific reason because it's it supported one of the founders of MSATO at his time in need. So that's that's our reason. No, that's that, that's a good enough reason. That's a good enough reason. Anything that supports soldiers and uh, has a direct impact on their betterment is, you know, that that's good enough. You know, because these, you know, we can we can live our relaxed lives and you know our lazy existences because there's you know guys out there shedding blood in the mud for us. So, you know, I'm I'm all about it. I'm all about it, and we we will definitely have all the information for you guys to check them out and uh, go support them yourself. You know, go go show them some love from the from the airsoft community. Definitely. Um. Okay, so on that note, tell us. Uh, just give us give us a few a few plugs 
Um, where can guys find information on MSATO? Uh, when can where can guys find out about this op? Um, and what's what's next for what's the what's in the next like three months for you guys? Um, right now, uh, MSATO we're MSATO.org. Um, so it that's that's the best place. We're also on Facebook. It's under MSATO Cohorts Milsim. And, um, you know, the, those are really the two best places to, you know, to, to get the information and stay up to date as far as the events that we have coming up. Um, I will be putting up our 2015 schedule, you know, fairly soon. Okay. And um, like I said, we got, the, uh, we got the location in the Poconos. Just trying to pick a date. Um, I'm probably going to be doing something there in the next couple of months. That's probably going to be my next event. Um, I got Fitchburg. They're actually filming a movie at the Phil Fitchburg location um, uh, during uh, uh, February. And we're actually going to be helping them out with that because they needed a, a SWAT team uh, for the movie. So oh, very cool. Yeah, so we, we're – MSATO, the cohort section of MSATO is involved in entertainment. So uh, we actually have some, some good contacts in the entertainment community. So we're going to help these guys out um, with, with some airsofters and all the gear and turn them into SWAT guys for, uh, for this movie. Um, it'll probably be like a sci-fi type. It's a sci-fi movie. So it'll be, it's a low budget, you know, a couple million dollars. Um, oh, only a couple million dollars. <laughs> Well, I mean that's that's considered a low budget movie, so it's a right. million dollar budget that they got. So it'll be something like a sci fi movie. You know, you might see it on Sci Fi Channel or something like that. But it, it'll be something cool. Um, so we're involved in that. That's actually why, uh, because of our involvement uh, with them during February, that's actually why I had to have Operation DefCon when I did. Uh, Operation DefCon is January twenty fourth, twenty fifth. Um, we actually only probably have about. Um, I know I had less than 20 spots open for that uh, at this point. We, we only have a few. We're limiting it to uh, 200 players uh, because, of, because of the way the AO is. Um, we actually are going – actually, it's 220 players is where we're at. So we're at 200, uh, but we got the cadets from West Point who have 20 players coming down. So we, we end up going to uh, 220 as the, uh, as the cutoff point. So we have about 20 spots left uh, for that. And uh, after that, probably we're looking at March, end of March, early April. I'm probably going to look at that Poconos location because uh, it's, like I said, it's just a nice AO going from a nuclear power plant, which is a big building, to 78 acres with 50 honeymoon cabins. And they even, I even found the commercial from, I think, 1979. Uh, so I'll have that wow. on, on, on there for the resort. They got the heart shaped tubs and, uh, and the heart shaped beds. Nice, uh, nice, nice. <laughs> All right, cool. So, um, you'll you'll have to you, you know we'll have to get a hold of you again when it when that op comes up to hear some more about it because that sounds like it's a really cool one. I definitely want to go to that one. So, um, that should be pretty exciting. We got cheated out of the Poconos, unfortunately, um, when the weather struck for John. So it'll be yep. good to get out there. Um, okay, so, uh. You guys have 20 spots left. Is there room? I mean, it, when, when is the uh, when are you guys letting guys? You're gonna let guys fill it up to the last minute, or can can some of our listeners will they still have time to go and register and it, sign up and everything? Um, I don't know. I don't know when you broadcast this, so I guess. <laughs> um, well, today is the 13th, so they will have. I'll put this up the 14th, so you guys are seeing oh, us the 14th. Yeah, Hello, so, the future. <laughs> and, uh, if if. If you're quick, uh, absolute deadline is the 20th. Um, I'm actually submitting the roster on Saturday, uh, which I think is, what, the 17th? So I'm, I'm submitting the roster to the security um, personnel on the 17th. This is not an event you can just show up to. I actually have to have your name on a roster in order to get onto this. There's a security guard at, a, at the gate. Got to be on the roster and, you, and to get onto the facility. Right. Uh, this facility is still has the fence. It's still guarded, even though it's decommissioned. It's it has another power plant that's right next door to it that is still active, and it's actually part of the national grid. Um, so there is security that 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 is required, and, and it was really difficult to get on here. We actually have to have um, 
personnel from the electric company with us. Um, and that's why we're regulated. And this was a very, you know, tough AO to get. So the uniqueness of it in, is an incredible. If you, if you have a last minute chance and want to come up to Long Island, uh, we got Dale, you know, we got Dale. Uh, it's a great opportunity. He's doing his book signing Friday night at the hotel. So if you want to stop by and drink with him, uh, we're going to be at the Ramada Inn. Um, it's about 15, 20 minutes from the place. And we're, he's going to, if, if you got a book, he'll sign the book. We're not, and you can drink, have some beers with, uh, with these guys and, uh, get to, get to get some real war stories from them uh, Friday cool. night. And, uh, so we got that opportunity. And uh, so it's it's last minute, but yeah, t till the twentieth would be my drop dead because we only got twenty people. Me throwing another twenty people on the list isn't going to be a big deal. Um, so if we get them, we get them. We'll throw them on there. So if there's okay, so guys out there that want to sign up, it's an incredible opportunity. Go to uh, msato.org. You can see an incredible amount of pictures. I've got over a hundred pictures of the facility. And if you know who Dale Comstock is, and you want to come out and meet him. It's you, you're never going to get this opportunity anywhere else. Um, hopefully this is going to go well and he's going to join us. He, he told me he would join us for future ops, but he's got an incredibly busy schedule. And so oh, yeah. we, he's actually flying in from the shot show Friday to come to our event. Everyone's like, wow. Oh, I'm going to the shot show. The shot show ends Friday. Dale's leaving there flying in so he can come to our op. Wow. So, that's the, how tight his schedule is. And when, when I asked him, I said, are you sure you can do this? He's like, I'll make it happen. And he is. Is his, is his wife coming out with him? Uh, I not getting involved in the whole wife thing. <laughs> no, I don't know. She, it's funny because you know what kind of led me to, uh, you know, I went to your page and that's how I found out about Dale Comstock and the guys who are seeing this know I posted that Dale Comstock's coming to your event. Uh, you know, maybe a few days ago I posted that, but his wife liked this weekend airsoft. And I was like, who is this? You yeah. know? And then I looked at her page and I said, that's Dale Comstock's wife. You know, and I was like, that's strange, you know, and so yeah. I didn't put it together until so now you're saying that. And I know she was putting on her page that she's going to shot show. So I was like, oh, maybe she's coming out. OK, but well, that's cool, though. That's cool. I mean, Dale Comstock, if you guys don't know who Dale Comstock is, you're slipping, you know. He's, yeah, you know, uh, there's um, on on the MSATA website, if you go to the media section, um, there's an interview with him that he did for uh, for somebody else. But it's a it's a great interview, and if you want to learn something about it, it's about a forty five minute interview uh, when his book was coming out, and take the forty five minutes and, and listen to that interview. And he he's just an incredible guy, and to have this opportunity to be able to work with him, um, and like I said, this op, people are actually going to get that opportunity to actually work with him and plan missions, and it's not like I said, you're you're going to be in there with these VIPs. Can you imagine the the well? I mean, of course you can imagine it, but for you know, for 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 like me, for instance, you know what I mean? I, I've I, I've had the experience that you kind of spoke of, where you know you get to play with you know a Bubba Moore or a uh, Max Mullen or uh you know Danny McKnight, you know what I mean? You get to you get to you you get these guys are your COs, they give you instructions, stuff like that. But can you just imagine, you know, I'm imagining myself sitting around a table, you know, in a lightly dark in a in a in a, in a poorly lit room with a with blueprints and Dale Compton's like, okay, your team goes in here, da 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 and you're like you're just sucking up all this information. He's like, no 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 you don't want to do that because this might happen. You know, and you're just like it's so much. So I, I mean I think it's an awesome experience. I, I wish I could go to that op. Yeah, um, the, the uniqueness about Dale when you when you whether you read his book or um, he actually one of after he left Delta one of his jobs when he started a private military um, uh, security system or security force um, was uh, dealing with the nuclear power plants. So having wow. him come to this one actually kind of brings him back to something he did after he left Delta and got into the private sector and, and started his own security company. He was actually dealing with the security for um, this exact situation of, you know, people invading a nuclear power plant. So he has an extremely unique uh, viewpoint on it. Absolutely. He, right. th that, he did this for the government. And now you not only, you know, was he Delta Force, but he actually worked with the government to secure the nuclear power plant 
nuclear facilities in, in, and helping them design that, you know, their security. So if something like this did happen, how would they deal with it? So it's an incredible, you know, yeah. just an incredible opportunity. We're, we're fortunate to have them. So not only is it the, the nuclear power plant, but having somebody who actually did it there. Right, uh, right. It's, it's going to be awesome. No, that's awesome. That, that, is, that, is, that is really sweet. And what an opportunity, man. God, I wish I knew about this. I wish I knew before, like, you know, I would have to tell Black Sheep and say, sorry, Black Sheep. <laughs> um, well, okay. Well, I do right now. I, I, have, I have the opportunity, as long as everything goes well, I, I should be able to use this location again. Um, what I'm looking at is most likely September um, because – I don't want to do anything in the summer in the Hamptons because Long Island, you know, it gets crazy right. out there uh, with everyone leaving New York City, going out to the Hamptons. So it, it just isn't possible, you know. And so I'm probably looking at September utilizing the site again. Okay. Um, okay. So if, if you miss this one, it'll still be a probably 200, maybe 220 person game because of the, the size of the AO. Um, so if if we do it again and I post it up, I'll get the word out. I'll contact you and and let you know so you can get the word out. But it, it's going to be a, a limited number of spots, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get Dale back. And I'll try to work something out it's far enough out that uh, I might be able to book him in for for a future future time like that and work around his schedule if possible. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Well, you guys heard it here first. But I don't want you to operate on the possible <laughs> chance that, one, we might get this location again, and two, we might get Dale Comstock again. You guys, there's 20 slots left. Go get them now. Fill it up, okay? Um, you're going to have a great time. You're going to meet Dale Comstock. You're going to play in a very unique AO, you know, not and, and not to knock anybody else's places, but, you know, a power, a, a nuclear power plant, you know, that's still kind of semi, you know, it's, it's guarded and it's, it's up to date with the, you know, probably the, the more current post 9-11 standards, which is something that most guys, if you don't know about that in world, you know, you may not understand the difference between a power plant from 1962 and a power plant now. You know what I mean? It's a big oh, difference. Yeah. So, you know, and when you say it's a fortress, definitely guys who know understand it is a fortress. You know what I mean? So we, we definitely, you know, want to take advantage of this great AO as soon as we can. So anybody who can go sign up, let's fill this place up. Um, <laughs> let's let, let's go and have fun with Dale with uh, uh, Dale Comstock and uh Come back, give us an AAR. We definitely want to hear from you guys if Absolutely. you guys go out to this op. And, um, you know, uh, Tom, it's a pleasure having you on. You know, we learned a lot. We got a, we got a little history. <laughs> we got a, we, we, uh, we learned something, you know. Uh, you, you've stepped our game up a little bit. We learned how, that Milsim was Milsim a long time ago and not just this year, so that's cool. <laughs> um, and uh, we want to have you back on, man, to talk about, you know, whatever you guys are doing this year. So, yeah. I, I look forward to seeing you again, and guys out there watching, definitely, we're going to have the sites for you, we're going to have Lone Survivor for you, we're going to have, Del, the, there's a Dale Comstock video that they ha, you guys have posted up, we'll post that up also, um, you guys can get all this information on msato.org, so definitely check that out, uh, we'll have links to you guys, you, to msato's YouTube page, and stuff like that, and some of the old classic videos that I love, that got me started playing Airsoft, that, that, MSAT, that were at msato ops, so... Definitely check them out, guys. Tom, it was a pleasure having you on. It really was. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I look forward to not only talking to you again, but you're definitely going to be coming up to one of our ops at some point. We're yeah, gonna absolutely. Here. Absolutely. <laughs> We're going to make it happen. It's honestly a shame. I've been dri I'm like, I drove to Georgia. I, I drove to Indiana. I'm driving to Mississippi, you know, next week. And I have never gone to the, to the Northeast. And Northeast is like... You know, it's like the home of uh, mount sites and CQB. You know, it's it's the envy of everyone on the West Coast. You know, they they you know the people on the West Coast they base their entire thought process about what the East Coast is about, basically on the Northeast. You know, this little square of you know hardcore you know um, players. You know that you guys that honestly, Black Sheep and Imsato have cultivated. You guys created that. You know, whole world up there. So. It's exciting, man. You know, and I'm I'm glad to have you on. 
guys, check this show out. Actually, you're watching this show. I don't know why I'm still checking it out. But, um, okay, so, Tom, I'm not going to keep you any longer. I appreciate it. I know you got to get dinner or do whatever you got to do. Um, but thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Talk soon. All right, absolutely. All right, guys, this is James with This Week in Airsoft. For Tom and M. Sato, we're out.